Hello everyone, Blender 4.0 is coming out a little bit later than I expected, which means I've got some time to burn before our traditional release video. So what I figured I'd do is just give you like a little update on some of the things I've been working on or experimenting with, because typically we don't really talk about like the smaller, I don't want to say more boring parts of working with Blender, but like all the rough around the edges, unfinished projects and experiments and things which would turn into videos if they were given enough time, but ultimately just fall by the wayside. So that's what we're going to do in this video, just talk about all the individual things which were not interesting enough to turn into their own videos. So first of all, a while ago I did a video called Create Realistic Semi-Procedural Materials in Blender, and it was talking about an interesting workflow that I really wanted to play around more with, where you effectively take a clay sample in real life, and then you physically create different types of imperfections on it, and then use those as image samples, and then through a tool, whatever tool you like, I think I was using Substance Sampler, you can modify those sources to make them more appropriate for digital materials, and even make them seamless if you like. But making them seamless isn't necessarily required, because I was making use of my version of a scatter node. Now there are lots of people that have done different types of scattering nodes using the Voronoi method. So effectively what it does is it takes these images and then using a kind of Voronoi cell pattern, it splats them around an object. Mine still has quite a lot of room for improvement, but the results were pretty good, combining some of my physical clay samples with the scattering method. And this was effectively building up to a tool which I never really got around to finishing. Let me open up a more complete file. So this was working towards a product of semi-procedural materials. You as an artist would have access to to a toolbox, like an actual digital toolbox full of materials, which you could select from and then apply to your objects. And there'd be a combination of a procedural focus and a much more realistic focus, such as is the case with this object here. It'd be compatible with EV and cycles and also support displacement via adaptive subdivision if you really wanted to plug that in. So the whole point would be to effectively give like concept sculptors some really interesting surfaces to work with where they would just adapt to the shape of any object. Again, other people have done versions of this before, but I wanted to have my own take at it and I was really really impressed with the results that I could come up with but again I just never really got around to finishing the project. Part of it was because of standardization. This is something we'll come back to for Biogen as well but basically I really like standardizing things in a way basically making it easy to have a process where if I had more image samples which I could bring into Blender I could turn them into new materials just like this clay one with very minimal effort so that would require making some new node groups where I could just like plug in image samples and it would be much less messy than this. So that was just another step I needed to do to make it easier for me to basically like mass produce materials like this from real samples. So that's kind of why the product was suspended a bit. I like to use the term hibernating because I just never really got around to starting that process and then got distracted by other things. You can see a little example of the displacement here. So this is with the geometric displacement and then without it becomes a smoother subdivided cube. So I quite like how it all looked in the end. So that is all bagged up and in a place where I can access it if I need to get back to it in the future but that's also a downside of not actually releasing a product. It means that if my drives all explode, or if there's like a house fire, then I will lose everything unless I've uploaded it to my cloud drive, which I may or may not have done. I need to double check that. But this is also just a reminder for you now, if you've been working on any important projects recently, make sure to back up your work. Before we move on though, someone did recently, very recently actually, for me it was only like 20 minutes ago, offer to pay for access to this material, even though the product hasn't been released yet. So I let them pay and then I've given them a download link so they can get using it with a few conditions in mind. So I know that there are people that are really interested in giving this a try when it's ready. And also the file that I gave to that person, I've also put on our exclusive private server with unreleased files and content. If you want to learn a bit more about that, go to codasol.online slash network. But the easiest way to get in is to subscribe as a $5 patron for over a year. Speaking of which, I need to do my monthly check for new patrons who are eligible for that server. So the next thing is that I've been taking a look at Blender 4.0, the beta build, to see whether my add-ons are actually going to work properly properly with it. And the initial signs are not good. <laughs> so basically I've been starting with modular workspaces, kind of updating to make sure that it does work properly. Um, however, we think we bumped into a bug in Blender 4.0, an interface related bug. Now most things are functional now. So like I've updated the default thumbnail size to represent the uh, the new numerical size here, which I actually quite like because you can get things a lot smaller than you could before. And it also properly selects the correct asset library as well. Um, if you're seeing two buttons here, this is actually just a side effect of using Visual Studio code with the Blender development extension. This is one of the weird things about Blender. Sometimes depending on where you run it, you'll see different results. So running the add-on from Visual Studio Code registers the button twice, but running it independently on Blender only registers it once, even though the code's the same. So 
it's a bit weird. But anyway, we bumped into a bit of a bug here. So if I open the asset browser using a button, not working anymore. Nope. Okay, now the asset browser buttons aren't working. This is typical. Let's try this again. Okay, now I'm running it without Visual Studio Code, asset browser button, Pi menu, and then close error. So the error here is a null point error or a null PTR error. And it's to do with how the behavior has changed with context overrides, which I'm not really an expert on because I tend to avoid using context overrides, but um, it's actually one of my gripes with Blender. I kind of hate the context system. Basically just says what is allowed or not allowed to run depending on the status of Blender. For example, if you're in edit mode or object mode, then you're going to have access to different things. But the context system creates all kinds of headaches for Python development, especially when it comes to accessing different things in the interface. Now, what this requires is actually changing the code because the way that you override things has changed slightly in 4.0, but even updating the code doesn't really solve everything. So a friend of mine has given me like a little script to test to see or to try and replicate the bug. And what they say is basically when we run bpy.obs.screen.area close, it changes context.screen slash window to none. But if we do it with temp override, it should keep the current context state intact, which in 4.0 it doesn't. Thus we face the errors. You can run the code below in 3.6 and 4.0 to see what I mean. All right, so let me grab this. All right, so I'm in 3.6. What will this do? Alt P and it closed the interface section there. And we see no errors, but we do see the print statements, the first and the second check, fine. So let's take this and try this in 4.0. I'm going to reset the file and run. Okay, so here we go. We have it closed because we were just calling a simple bpy.ops. We can see the checks are different. So the first check actually preserves the area we had chosen and the second check says none. So this is a different result to 3.6. So basically this really kind of boring inconsistency is causing a few problems with the um, like the opening and closing method we're using for modular workspaces to like detect which areas have already been split open and then to close those as well. So yeah, so, so typically this is something that I wouldn't put on a video because code issues, very boring. All right, so over in Biogen land, I've been playing a bit with geometry nodes. Again, kind of going back to like the sculpt material, trying to standardize things in the way that there are a variety of ways to like voxelize mesh content in geometry nodes. And and the different methods will have different specific values. And depending on the technique you're using, you might end up in a situation where you're actually defining the voxel quality like twice in the same geometry thread, if that makes sense. And also some methods of voxelization are better for larger scale uh, collections of objects than smaller ones. So for example, for voxelizing fields, I found that using the size method is sometimes more appropriate for larger like collections of objects than say the amount method. Now, when it comes to like making a geometry nodes based presets for things like future versions of Biogen, what I wanted was a consistent method or a consistent set of node groups which I would use to make those presets so that I would know that I was using the same voxelizing technique every time where appropriate, which kind of just makes it easier to manage things. And then also if there are improvements to individual nodes that will propagate to other node groups using those as well, like a very modular system, like we've always done with the modular metals product and stuff like that. So what this means is I've effectively just been like doing a lot of testing of say reading things from like collections and trying different methods to see what is more appropriate a field method like this as I'm calling it or an object method like this which is clearly worse for doing like large scale um, object collections and requires adapting values um, depending on which method you're using and then even then it's not exactly the same because we need to kind of like you know modify smoothing values so I've been trying to find ways to keep quality consistent across different voxel methods uh, which is a little bit tricky because like I said the values aren't exactly the same. In the process of trying to standardize these methods, I've also created some custom icons for the node groups as well. So this is like, again, not very super exciting stuff. Uh, but I still think it's kind of important. Another thing as well is like preserving the quality of objects that are voxelized as they decrease in scale. So a lot of the time what happens is if you have like a consistent quality for a voxelized object, as you turn the scale down, it doesn't really change the grid resolution. So you start getting like all little weird flaky looking stuff happening to the mesh. But I have like a scale multiplier here, which kind of takes that into mind when you're kind of upping and downing the scale. And it tries not to go too over the top. You know, it, it doesn't like crash the system necessarily but it will go a little bit slower as is more geometry. But it, what it means is that if you make really small content, you're still going to get a pretty good quality of voxelization going on there. And you can see how it tries to preserve the shape. So little things like this, I've just been working on to again, try and standardize things a bit for my own process going into the future. But I will keep working on that. Again, I do little bits of work like this and then move on to other projects. But I look at this and I think that's not really exciting enough for a proper video on its own. Like I would have to make some really fancy effects with it and then maybe do a breakdown of those effects and then 
people will ask like where's the next version of the add-on and so and so but it does lead me into like new directions of ideas for example it's ridiculously easy to pick up content inside of a collection and then voxelize it or even kind of modify that content in some way now that reminds me that when i've done python experiments in blender and tried to create objects using raw python code it's doable but very complicated complicated if you want to make something that's quite complex mesh wise and voxelizing things with python is like oh you don't want to do that unless you're using kind of pre-made functionality in blender but now we don't really need to worry about that because if we just made something relatively complex in python a mesh or a collection of meshes and then just dumped that into a collection then geometry nodes can pick it up and then use that as a complex source input so what i was suddenly thinking was similar to the way that i've created easy bpy as like an abstraction layer to help with coding with the blender python api what if i created a kind of maybe simplified geometry module which would help people with python create smart input geometries that would then be dumped into collections in blender which geometry nodes could then pick up and then do some fancy stuff with i don't know whether that would actually be beneficial or rather if just making more complex node groups of geometry nodes would be the better way about it but that's the kind of stuff that i've been thinking about. I think the idea of bridging Python and geometry nodes is cool but really you have to prove it for interesting use cases to actually like demonstrate the necessity of it. So there has been some work on our community challenge. If you don't know, we're running a community challenge with the theme, something wonderful is revealed. I recommend watching the announcement video because the way we do these, these new challenges is by giving people an optional target they can aim towards in terms of a format. So for example, the target is a 2560 by 1080 30 frames a second animation of any length you like with the theme, something wonderful is revealed. Now people don't have to follow that target. They can make like a real life 2D piece of artwork or a sculpture or a regular piece of digital art or a piece of music if they wanted. But the target is basically for people that don't really want to think about the format necessarily and just want something to aim towards. Now I was supposed to be pushing this challenge a bit more on social media, but I kind of got distracted, which happens. So we haven't really had many submissions, but the ones that we have had are quite nice. And if you head on over to the Discord server, we've got like a challenge discussion thread or a channel where you can take a look at some people's ideas and see some progress and then in the submissions channel we can see what's been made so i just wanted to show a submission by thomas but i'm going to turn the audio on for this as well and the reason why i'm showing this early is because we might not end up with enough submissions to do a dedicated video showing them off so why not take a look now That's quite a sweet one. I like the material quality as well on the uh, on the ballerina there. I also like the idea of something unfolding as well. The lighting's really good. So that's quite a pretty one. And they've kind of complied to the target uh, ratio here as well, uh, which is very cool. We've got another one here from Briac. So let's just take a quick look. mysterious. So yeah, I really like seeing the different interpretations that people come up with. Like I said, we, you've got like a whole other month to do it, but actually depending on the time that this video goes out. But like I also said in the original video, there are a few rewards up for grabs as well. Not massive ones, but like a piece of merchandise and access to our exclusive server, which, oh yes, also seems to include that sculpt material that I mentioned earlier. And hey, if you had taken part, then you probably would have had your submission put on the video just now. So yeah, like I said, there are other people taking part in the challenge discussion, but uh, they're not done yet. So we'll see. What else has been going on? Oh yeah, my obsession with making physical art stuff has continued, even though I haven't really been speaking about it. And I have this weird thing, right? Where even though I make stuff, I am resistant to posting it online or literally even putting it on the store. So like I've started doing these larger collages of different parts of like my notes as a Blender YouTuber and doodles as well. And I quite like these ones. There's like a lot to read into on them. So I think they're pretty sweet but these aren't even on the store yet i was gonna like reformat the store and kind of do images in a different way one realization i did have was that as i finished making pieces of artwork and products like this i would immediately package them up so that they'd be ready to sell but then there was a downside to that in the way that since they had been packaged i would no longer be able to like show them off or take new pictures of them and use them for like like some of my other social media profiles so what i've done now is i'm basically just keeping them out of the packaging and they're all kind of behind me. I don't know if you can, like I've got different piles of stuff now so that they are accessible 
for future content. And there's actually quite a lot to show off now, but maybe I think I'll leave that for another time for a more dedicated video so it's not getting in the way of uh, Blender content for people who aren't really that interested. I'm working on a kind of collage at the moment related to my trauma with blood tests because I had some traumatic experiences as a child. Um, and it includes a ticket for one of my blood tests, which is funny. I've been collecting things for a while that I wanted to use in artwork. For example, this is a bit of a weird one, but I've got a letter from a Jehovah's Witness back where I used to live and also one where we are now as well. So I was going to make a piece of artwork out of both of them. Might sound weird, but I don't know. My, my digital artwork and my physical artwork is very different now. Like the physical one's all about telling stories. I guess, in the way that like the attention deficit things are a story about me like trying to pay attention. I write on the back of them what I was doing at the time and these collages are like that as well. They're like fragments with collections of my notes and doodles and it's kind of becoming a bit of an obsession. I did also say in the original video when I started talking about the physical merge that I wanted to do something interesting like setting some of them on fire if they never sold. And then some people had a bit of a go at me for it. Not a go, but they were concerned. Saying, no, don't do it. Never set your artwork on fire. And then I thought about it and I was like, well, yeah, I think you're right actually. I have this policy of seeing everything as a resource, basically like recycling everything in effective ways. So I kind of see like physical artwork the same way. If you don't like a piece of artwork, you don't have to completely destroy it. You can also recycle it for new artwork as well, which I think kind of like adds to the story of the new piece, like this evolving thing. Yeah, I guess I'll talk about that a bit more in the future as well. So yeah, we're taking a look at sculpt materials. I mentioned a bug and modular workspaces. I'm going to have to try out the other add-ons as well to make sure that they're all functional. We mentioned biogen standardization for geometry nodes, voxelite we took a look at some challenge entries. Again, you've got a month left and we spoke about some physical artwork as well. I'm still responding to casual sponsorship requests. So if you want to get your sponsorship on a video, if you want me to talk about your channel or any projects you're doing, head on over to codesalt.online slash services. Otherwise, you can join me on Patreon to help fund all the different projects I do. And also, will this be ready by the time the video goes out? I'm starting YouTube channel memberships, but just for fun. Basically, when it's ready, editor Curtis, tell me if it's ready. Ooh. It's a few pounds a month. You get access to exclusive emojis because you know we're a very emoji centric channel. And also apparently you get this little badge next to your name and depending on how I've designed it, that badge will evolve over time. So the longer you're a member, it will show off by your name. So if that's available now, then you are welcome to subscribe to again, help fund everything. Otherwise, if you made it this far, please put a, what are we going to do? It's because there's been a variety of stuff. Put a package emoji. We've done the package emoji a lot. Let's not do that. Let's come up with something more interesting. Ah, nice. Put the unicorn emoji emoji in the comments to show me if you made it this far through the video. The reason we're doing a unicorn is because it's a callback to an earlier point in the channel, which some of you may remember, where I put on like a unicorn dressing gown for our 100,000 subscriber celebration. In the last video, I also started a two week 50% discount on modular workspaces. Black Friday is coming up soon as well, so there will be a discount, but that old one may still be active depending on when this goes out. So you're welcome to take a look. And also remember that on my gum road, we have purchasing power parity enabled. So depending on who you are around the world, you may already be entitled to discounts on my Blender tools and resources. If you just head on over to my Gumroad and take a look, they may automatically apply when you click on the product. So yeah, hopefully I've got more interesting stuff to show you soon. Have a fantastic day, everyone, and I will see you next time.